Uh, thanks. Thank you for inviting me. It's, it's great to be here. Uh, I seem to recall that at some point I'd been to uh, a users group meeting here in San Francisco, but I, I just can't remember. So, uh, so this is cool. One of the things I love about the Salesforce ecosystem is that there's a real focus on solving problems. Right? You know, Salesforce is a customer company, and we, I think, generally obsess over solving real problems as compared to just creating technology for its own sake. So when it comes to blockchain, which is a mystery to a lot of us, even those who work in blockchain, if only because it's changing so quickly, it's important to have some context and look not so much at the technology as much as the problems. What are the problems? Are we solving the problems? And so on. So I'm going to start out by providing some context. And don't worry, because I will show you actual blockchain. But right now, I want some context. So it all starts with paper. Remember that stuff, you know, pens? We, we used to use those. And uh, along came software, like word processors, spreadsheets, paint graphics, CAD, things that do what paper did, but better, easier, the killer apps. And blockchain's going to fit in there. I'll get to that in a moment. Uh, because blockchain is also a paper thing. Now, there's sort of a sense with blockchain that we, we all feel like, wow, you know, this is, this is a great thing. This is a big thing, but, but we don't quite get it. And, and what's it going to be? And is it catching on? And so on. And, and there's this sort of suggestion, sometimes explicit, that, hey, those things took a long time to catch on also, like word processors and spreadsheets and so on. Uh, no. Uh, I was there, right? Gray hairs. <laughs> Trust me. <laughs> When we saw the first word processors, it was like, yes. And all those companies who built word processors and spreadsheets and all that kind of stuff, they did not go out and raise money or do ICOs or stuff. They shipped product, and people were throwing money at them so fast you couldn't believe it. I mean, I was a tiny niche of it. I did components for Visual Basic. And my first trade show there, we brought a bunch of boxes of product not knowing what was happening. And we did not have time to talk to people because my staff was so busy swiping credit cards. They were just selling products. So everybody knew that these apps were amazing. There wasn't this, it's going to be good for something someday thing going on. So blockchain. Blockchain's a ledger. Everyone will agree to that. The skeptics and the believers, it is a way of recording a list of transactions. It's doing something that paper used to do. But it's not the first time we've done ledgers uh, in software. You all have ledgers, right? You all have bank accounts. You all keep track of numbers. And you use Quicken, or you use a accounting program, or you use a spreadsheet, or so on. So ledgers in software is nothing new. But wait a minute, OK? Blockchain is a shared ledger, right? It's a distributed ledger. Lots of people can access it. Well, guess what? We have those too, right? These are networked. You all log in to your bank account or your credit card statement. When you log in there, that's a shared ledger. It's a secured ledger. It's a ledger that you, know, you have a certain amount of trust in the bank to keep track of your numbers and to manage as you take money out. And sometimes they take money out. But it's this trusted, secure ledger relationship. So we have it. So what is blockchain? What happens if is someone you can't trust? That's where blockchain comes in. Blockchain, blockchain is a distributed ledger for people who can't trust each other. It is the ledger for people you hate. <laughs> now, that's what blockchain is. That's what everybody's talking about. You don't trust someone, but you have to share a ledger. Now, I don't know about you. Maybe you spend every day saying, God, you know, I have this ledger that I, I have to share with people I hate. How do I do that? But I think most of us don't. So I don't know, right? But that's what blockchain is. So, but, but then they'll say, you can tell I'm a little bit of a skeptic here, but we're setting context. Uh, here's some things about blockchain that you will hear. It's secure. It's immutable. It cuts out the middleman, you know, the leeches who take the, the funding in the middle. And you have smart contracts, whatever that is. OK. <laughs> and 
these sound great. These sound great. Except, let's think about this for a moment. If you lose the password for your online bank, you don't panic, right? You have a password recovery, or maybe you, know, you go into your branch, show your ID, and it's like they get you set up again. Cool. If you have, God forbid, uh, a family member, a parent, or a relative, and they're killed in an accident or they pass away, and they have these assets, bank accounts, well, you know what? It's in the family. You know, you might have to go through probate, or a court order, or some legal action, but ultimately, those assets will stay in the family. But with blockchain, cryptocurrencies, and so on, if you lose that password, if you lose the key to the wallet, that asset is gone. It's gone, and you know what? No government action, no legal action, no lawsuit, no probate, no judge is ever going to get it back. It's gone. So, blockchain's more secure. Is that good? Really? Maybe there's such a thing as too much security in the real world. It's immutable. Immutable means those transactions are permanent. They are fixed forever. But you know what? We're human. We make mistakes. Immutable means that our mistakes are forever. They're permanent. They're locked in. You can't fix them. Cuts out the middleman. That's a big one. I have a friend who says, yeah, real estate, man. We're not going to need realtors. We're going to be able to sell houses on blockchain. True story. 20 years ago, something like that, to give the numbers perspective, I was selling my condo, and I said, you know, the market's good. I don't want to pay the 6%. I'm going to sell my own. I'm going to do my own sale. I'm going to save the 6%. I'll hire a lawyer, you know, 1,000 bucks, a few hundred bucks, whatever. And I am thankful because a very persistent real estate guy came to my house, and he said, look, what were you going to sell for? Well, so I'm going to list it for $250,000. I know that sounds cheap, but at the time, <laughs> that was the highest any condo in my complex had ever been like way back before the last re previous recession, right? And he said, okay, I will sell it for 6% more than that, guaranteed. If not, we have no deal. And I will sit in your house while the painter is there and the cleaners and so on and, and take care of everything. No lose situation, right? Hate paying the 6% to the middleman, but whatever. He sold it for 310000 My neighbors were aghast. Nobody imagined. Middlemen, the intermediaries, these trusted third parties that, that we use, they actually bring some value to the table, right? Um, when I buy stuff online, I use a credit card because if something happens, if it doesn't get delivered, or if it's broken, or if, if there's a disagreement, I'll call Visa and I say, hey, you know, that deal, you know, there's a problem. Help me. And they'll go and they'll go back to the vendor and they'll help, they'll fight for me. So, you know, I, I like middlemen. Smart contracts. The idea of a smart contract is that when a transaction happens as part of the transaction or as part of uh, a response to external events, some software will run and update or create a transaction or work on the blockchain. So you have intelligence in this blockchain, um, which means software is running. Software. Have any of you met perfect software? <laughs> So the imperfections, the bugs in the software world, they're going to get committed and they're going to be immutable too, <laughs> right? So yeah, these sounds, things sound really great, but when you think about it, it's like, really? Okay, so then why are we so excited? What's going on? Why are we crazy? Well, we're crazy, oops, because, because of cryptocurrency. We're crazy about blockchain because human beings will assign value. We will trade, we will sell, we will buy anything. We will go nuts over stamps that were canceled. We will go nuts over Pokemon cards. In, uh, I can't remember sometime what century it was, the entire uh, Dutch empire was taken down by tulips. Right? 16 something, okay? We do this. So if someone has a ledger which holds transactions and is able to say, well, let's create an algorithm that creates entries in this ledger and let's sell them. 
trade them, people will do that. And people did that, and some people made boatloads of money on it, right? And they will say, well, it's a currency. This is going to be a currency. And you know what? And, and here's what they'll say. They'll say, it's no different from a dollar bill, piece of paper. It only has the value that we assign to it because we assign value to symbols. And you know what? They're right. There is no difference between a dollar bill, a piece of paper as a symbol, and an entry in a Bitcoin ledger or a cryptocurrency ledger. I'm sorry. So, so what then makes, is, is, are these cryptocurrencies currencies? And here is where I would say they are, but they aren't. And the question you have to ask is this, when you, let's say you go abroad, you go to, to, to England, you visit London or something like that, and you buy British pounds. You don't buy those British pounds because you expect to sell them later at a profit. You buy them because you intend to use them as a medium of exchange, because we don't do barter very well. When you buy a cryptocurrency, are you buying it primarily as a medium of exchange, or are you buying it as a speculative asset? And for most people, <coughs> at least in this country, when they buy cryptocurrency, they're buying it as a speculative asset. They're buying it with the hope and intent to sell it at a profit later. So it's tulips, it's not a currency. Now, it's not everyone. They'll say, well, there are, there are countries in the world where you can't trust the banks, where you can't trust your local currency, where it's dangerous to go to the bank. Yeah, cryptocurrency is a currency for them. They're using it as a medium of exchange. I was talking to an individual here earlier today who said, uh, it, if I need to transfer money abroad, it takes two days and has huge fees. I can do it cheaper with a cryptocurrency. And yes, that is legit. That is a use of a cryptocurrency. But then I ask the question, well, is the reason that it takes two days to transfer money abroad because it's hard to do? Is blockchain the solution to the problem? Or is blockchain a competitive technology that might get those banks to get their act in order and make things cheaper using other technologies? Right? The reason it takes two days to transfer money abroad is social and political. It's not technological. So blockchain might drive them to that. It might replace them. But it's not magic in that sense. OK. So blockchain. Distributed ledger for people who do not, cannot trust each other. So I started and said, okay, well, blockchain on Salesforce, what, what does that mean? What does it mean to me? There are probably lots of different answers. You're going to hear one later from, from the other speaker. Um, oops. Well, here's an example of a use case that has nothing to do with cryptocurrency. I like the idea of blockchain for elections. I don't know how it would work, but you know what? Elections, immutable is good. Once you make that vote, you don't want to ever change it, and you don't want anyone else to be able to change it. That's good. And nobody trusts anyone. Uh, validation and counting would be so much easier if it was all on a public blockchain. I really like the idea. Now, I wish I could tell you that that would prevent debates over millions of illegal voters and, uh, and uh, who won the popular vote. It won't, because the people who, who would disagree are going to say, well, you, you know, Blockchain is alternate data or something. Uh, but, <laughs> but elections, I like that. That's a, that's a reasonable use case. But the other place that blockchain is really exciting, and this is the part that I, I'm thinking it's, it's worth really looking at, is that it's a digital signature for ledgers. Now, digital signa signatures is a huge cryptographic use case. It is, we can create a document. We can digitally sign it, and it's now tamper-proof. We do that all the time. But think about a ledger that has transactions happening frequently. To digitally sign the entire ledger every time someone does a transaction, because remember, any change requires a new digital signature, that's nuts, right? I mean, you'd, you'd be sitting there with you know, thousands of different digital signatures, each one for a different 
ledger. Blockchain provides incremental digital signatures for a ledger because each record, each block, is individually digitally signed. And it means that you can create a ledger that's tamper-proof and you can identify tampering at the record level, not the entire ledger level. And it's really useful for external validation. And, it's, and this is what led me, when I was working on this course, which is on Pluralsight, and I'll talk more about that later, to the idea of, OK, let me build a blockchain. And let me see if I can build a blockchain. This was my question. Could I build a blockchain that was actually sort of useful in Apex? And I did. And I called Pluralsight, and I said, hey, I think this would make an interesting course. And they said, sure. And there we are. So that's what I'm going to show you now. And I'm going to show it to you in the form of a story. So let me, let me first of all refresh this so there's a chance it will work. OK. Our blockchain takes the form of entries in a ledger. And for this particular company, what we're going to do is we're going to record closed opportunities. So you record an opportunity, the money comes in, and it's locked down. And at this point, it's locked down. Right? And you're going to want this for two reasons. You're going to want it to, to prove to your accountants that, yeah, you know, we did this deal. And you're also going to use it to commission your salespeople. Say, here, here's how much this, value was this deal was worth. So we're going to create a ledger entry. Now, in a real ledger, you would not have all of these fields. And I'll tell you what these fields are. Uh, the first one is the block hash. This is going to be the digital signature for this entire object, this record, this custom object. The prior block hash is going to be the hash value of the previous block. Now, does anyone not know what a hash value is? Be honest. One person is at least scratching. OK, we got a few. Think of a hash value as a black box. It's a magic number that you can apply to any piece of data at all. And you can churn and churn and churn the data, and you will come up with a number. And the characteristics of this number are thus. One, that piece of data will always produce the same hash value, always. Two, if you make any tiny change in the data, it will produce a completely different hash value. And three, it is impossible to go back from the hash value and figure out what the original data was. It's a one-way function, a one-way hash is what it's called. So when we say block hash, what we're saying is we're going to take values of other fields, and we're going to put them all together, and we're going to run this hashing algorithm, and we're going to come up with this magic number that represents the digital signature for that data. So the prior block hash is the hash of the previous block. The transaction hash is the hash only of the transaction data. And for us, the transaction data is uh, the name of the opportunity and the amount of the opportunity, a list of the fields in the transaction, and the date of the transaction. We're going to call this our private data. And the sequence is the number, the position of this block in the blockchain. Right? Each record is a block, and a whole bunch of them is a blockchain. Now, we're simplifying things a little bit here, because we only have one transaction in each block. And in a real blockchain, you would have lots and lots of transactions, and that's another story. But the principle is the same. Also, in a real Salesforce blockchain, you would never have people enter any of this stuff by hand. First of all, because you're not going to want to calculate any of these values. And second, because you certainly don't want anyone to change any of these values. So most of the stuff would be either read-only or hidden. But in our case, we're showing it because this is a demo. So we're going to create a new opportunity. Oh, one other thing. Because this is immutable, in a real organization, nobody would ever enter these by hand. This would be something that would be entered through automation, maybe after an approval process, after the money's arrived. Right? It's your last step, step in committing the transaction. So we're going to call this SF Meetup. And it's a $500 opportunity. And we're going to save it. OK, now, because this is a Salesforce blockchain, we're certainly not going to make you do the work. Uh, where's my mouse? 
Okay, I can't really see it here. Can I see it there? Oh, there it is. Okay. So when I entered this record, an apex trigger fired, and it calculated all of these values for me. And that's great. I now have a block in the blockchain. All right, so um, what's the next step in our story? The next step in our story, oh, here's one other part of this. Here's the challenge, right? In Salesforce, it's hard to do immutable because we have admins. And admins are administrators. <laughs> and we all have that little magic checkbox that says modify all data. <laughs> so immutable is hard to do. So you can make it hard, you can make it hard to change things, and I'm going to show you that in a second, but but it's not enough ever to do only Salesforce content because we can't make things immutable. But here's where distributed comes in. What we can do is we can say, you know what? I'm going to make this public. I'm going to publish to my accountants, to my lawyers, to my partners, to my salespeople. I'm going to publish a public record of the blocks. That way they can hold me accountable because if ever my blocks, my block hashes don't match the public record, they will know that I cheated, or they will know something is wrong, right? This is the magic of a private blockchain. It has to be distributed because you need to show the world that you're being honest. We're trust, right? Salesforce, trust-based organization. We are trust-based organizations, but to verify our trust, to in enhance that trust, we're being open and transparent about these records. But we don't want to share everything. We don't want people to know about every opportunity and amount. So what we do is we publish only the hash values. Now it's really hard to see here, but what we've got here is ledger entry number four, the block hash, the transaction hash, that's the hash of the transaction data. Um, well, I have the block hash twice, whatever. Um, no, the prior block hash, that's the last one. Now where did this get published? When I created that record, when, uh, what I did was, as it was saved, it also created a platform event. Now, the nice thing about platform events is that they can be read by multiple clients. In this particular case, uh, it is a browser running Comet D, which is one of the ways you can get push notifications. And there are other ways as well, uh, but this was convenient, and I could, steal the, see, yeah, I could steal the sample code off of Trailhead, uh, and it worked. So now the whole world has my records. I cannot change my ledger. If I change it, if an admin tampers with it, if anyone touches any of that data, the world will know. That's pretty cool, right? Uh, but they don't know the individual opportunities. Now, well, I'm going to continue with the story. So the salesperson who did this transaction left. You know, Maybe voluntarily, maybe he tweeted something and was asked to leave. <laughs> <laughs> and, and said, you know what, I, I'm going to, uh, I want that to be a $5,000 deal because I want my last commission check. So that salesperson goes and, uh, and goes to that, to that record and says, okay, I'm going to just take that number and we're going to make it a $5,000 deal. Is save, right? They haven't taken away access yet. It's like, whoa, there's a notice. Update of the immutable ledger entry records is not allowed. Now, it's pretty cool. <laughs> now, the reason it's not allowed is, you know, even though I've opened up all security here, is, is I'm an Apex developer and I know how to do triggers. So there is a very, very simple update trigger on this object that says, you can't update this object. No one ever can update this object. So that's pretty good protection. But our salesperson is creative, <laughs> has friends on the inside, and says, OK, well, you know, we know that's how they're doing it. So let's go ahead, and we're going we're gonna to go to that on update trigger. And even though it's a, it's a production org, <laughs> we are going to click that is active button and we're going to deactivate that trigger. 
okay? I don't know, can, I don't know if you can actually do that on production orgs for, for other triggers, can you? You're not supposed to, I don't know. But even so, they could deploy it. They, they, they have ways, they could, they could make this happen. And now, that person's gonna go in, and we've got our $5,000 and hit save. Ooh. Now, here's the thing. In a, in a real world org, you've got hundreds of transactions every day. If somebody tampers with a record, you're not gonna know. I mean, you might have field history, but you're not gonna know. Nobody's checking, right? Nobody's looking every day saying, has anybody, I mean, you've got thousands of changes going on there. You've got bulk, bulk uploads. Nobody's going and checking. So this would get missed. It could be missed for months. It could be missed forever, except that this is a blockchain. And blockchains are self-validated because you know what? That transaction hash value, it's wrong. It doesn't match that number anymore, which means the block value doesn't match anymore. And every 24 hours in this org, some scheduled apex is running. And that scheduled apex is doing, I'm just gonna fake it by running an anonymous apex code. And I'm gonna execute it. Okay, so it's busy, and it's validating the whole ledger. It's checking, it's recalculating all those values, it's recalculating the transaction hash, making sure the block hash matches, and so on. And somewhere there is a group that everybody important belongs to called Ledger Validation Group. And let's hit refresh it. And it's gonna come back and say Ledger Validation failed at sequence four. Now, wow, because you're, you know, you're admins and developers, you can catch group chatter, you can raise alarms. All of a sudden, everyone, the CEO, everyone in this group says, whoa, our ledger is not validating, something happened. And now you can investigate and you can look at the exact record and you can see who changed it and what time they changed it. And if you have field history on, you know what fields were changed and you can fix it and you can go and say, you can start, heads can start rolling, right? So it's not a 100% technological solution, but it is a real world solution. And the beautiful thing about it is, this does not change, does not require any changes to any of your process, really, right? The ledger, the blockchain sits on top of whatever your existing processes are, and you've just added this amazing ability to validate things. So let's go back to our ledger entry. Uh, you know, our field history, which I don't have turned on on this particular org, but presumably it says, no, the value really was 500. We're gonna save it. We're gonna go re our, rerun our validation. And hopefully, if I did this right, we'll refresh here. Did it get it? Did it finish yet? Okay, I haven't seen a new message. Let me make sure I ran that. Execute. Well, I have no idea why we're not seeing the message. We have one more try. Okay, well, trust me that at some point it should validate. Um, the trigger. No, the trigger just prevents the locking. It doesn't prevent, it oh. doesn't, has no impact on the validation. So, uh, you know, I don't know. I would have to look and figure out why this thing maybe ran, it ran yesterday or maybe it's just, yeah, no idea. But anyway, uh, it will validate, and maybe before the end of the session, I'll figure out what it didn't do right. And it'll basically come back and say, it's been fixed. This is the original failure, so I actually don't see the new post that should have come in from the new validation. Okay, so let's continue with the story, and let's imagine for a moment that that salesperson, who's very annoying, says, no, it really was $5,000, you know? Uh, and sues, 
So next thing you know, you've got lawsuits and discovery and people are coming in and logging into your Salesforce org. And they're coming in there saying, well, you know, prove to me that it wasn't. You show field history, say, well, maybe you tinkered with that too. I don't know if that's possible. Uh, but you don't really want strangers in your Salesforce org anyway. With the blockchain, you can go to them and say, look, uh, here's the published transaction log and chain. Here are the numbers for this transaction only. Figure it out for yourself. And they can run the hash, and they can prove absolutely that those transaction values were indeed the only ones that work with that particular transaction hash. So what you've provided is the ability to not only increase the level of trust, but to expose selected data to your partners and have it validated against the public blockchain. For example, when it comes to your accountants, what you might do is give them all of your opportunities and, and uh, totals. <coughs> Did something happen? Yeah, Ta-da! <laughs> <laughs> Told you it worked. Um, somebody was slow. Anyway. Uh, I don't know whether it was a delay, you know, if the validation is an asynchronous operation. It might have been a delay in the validation. It might have been a delay in updating chatter. I honestly don't know. Uh, could have been some network connectivity issues. So for your accountants, what you might do is you might just give them all of your records. And then your auditors, instead of having to come in and get on your org and look at everything, they can look at and trust the data you've provided because they can verify it against the blockchain. So, so this is, in my mind, this is called a private blockchain. Purists will tell you this is not a blockchain at all, right? Uh, there's a lot of argument over what really is a blockchain. As a software developer, I consider it a blockchain if it is a set of blocks that use cryptography to chain. Makes sense to me. Uh, so, but I think that's a cool use. I think that is a cool, reasonable, something that people might want to do. Now, I did, let me go back to slides. Uh, here. I did make one mistake. So when I had this idea to do this, this blockchain, I, I did not do what I should have done, which is an ICO and raise millions of dollars <laughs> and say, hey, I'm going to do Salesforce blockchain, and then I could get a lot of buzz, and then Salesforce could buy it. Instead, I spent a couple days, and I actually built it. What was I thinking? <laughs> um, so, uh, but, but there is a little bit of monetization here, but it's not going to cost you anything, because uh, I did create this course on Pluralsight. And I have here, I'll set them right up front. I don't know of enough, but a whole bunch of 30-day free trials for Pluralsight. So anybody can go and log in and take the course. And you can understand in depth what a blockchain is, look at what a cryptocurrency is, you know, actually looking at fields and looking at how it works, look at building out the ledger <coughs> objects, play with, download and play with all of the source code, and uh, have your own private blockchain on Salesforce. And maybe you'll be smarter than me, and you'll create an ICO and raise millions of dollars. Uh, but I do encourage you to do that. Uh, the link to the Salesforce blockchain course is bit.ly slash sfchain. On the left, there are uh, five free courses this week on Pluralsight uh, that include uh, one of my courses on Salesforce careers. And Don, do you recall, what is the other course? Uh, it's a diagramming Salesforce solutions. So, it's a play -by -play. Yeah, there's some amazing play-by-play -play courses there by some amazing technical architects that you're going to see stuff that you will not see anywhere else. So I encourage you to use these 30-day free trials and, and uh, really explore some of the stuff that's out there. And uh, I don't know what our time is, but I will now open it to questions. So if anyone has questions. So if I were a truly nefarious admin, wouldn't I just update your blockchain value and then cascade it down through the transaction? Great question. If you were truly nefarious admin, couldn't you recalculate the entire chain? Yes, you could. but Remember, your salespeople, your partners, everybody else out there has the one you published already. And if you suddenly come up and say, here's our accounting information, here's our chain, and they say, I'm sorry, 
your hash values don't match our hash values as of that date, they know that you've done that. They know you've caused problems and that, that you've done something nefarious. And again, heads will roll in the organization at that point. So, uh, and they'll be able to trace back, hopefully, who modified the record and who did that. And, and it will be very bad for them, almost as bad as tweeting. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? So yes? If, if someone did manage to muck with the record, um, you can't, the only way you, you can't guess it. You have to know what the original values were to put it back. Yes. There's and no other option. That's so, right. So if your nefarious admin didn't turn on field history track for those fields, that would be a problem. That's true. Could That's you, true. Could you not use another object type as a way of distributing? You can have multiple objects. Additionally. You could, again, this is, this is a demo in principle. You could build this blockchain onto any object, because it's just fields, right? Yeah, you could have so multiple the ledgers. Different servers around the world with their own ledgers have different objects. Which, you know. Any variations you could, you could, you could build this using external objects. Yeah, exactly. Sure, using Salesforce Connect. Absolutely, you could. Right. The key thing is not, uh, and and please let me be clear. I am not even suggesting that this is the way you should build a blockchain in Apex, <laughs> right? Like for production, for a real-world scenario. This is a technology demo. It's a demo of the principle of, of what blockchain is, how it works, what it could be used for. And in reality, there are numerous possible approaches to do it. You might do it on Heroku, right, and just do it through, through external calls and, and you know, build up secure things. You might publish it to the Ethereum platform or to some other blockchain platform and publish your records there. I mean, the opportunities are endless. The concepts, however, are, are pretty much the same. Yes? I think this is all really fascinating. Um, I'm just wondering, um, I think one of the biggest issues for Salesforce moving forward is that they are such a, they are so solid, solidified in their trust. You know, con, you know that's their very first value and you're basically coming in with blockchain and you're telling everybody that we don't trust each other and you know and 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 there's a reason and, and and we have heard of like you know historic and newsworthy crashes and uh, breaches in blockchain I mean I, I definitely I'm a proponent I think we all are but I just feel like the um, the trust kind of it's, it's, it's a little, it doesn't it seem a little irreconcilable at this point? So, so there are two aspects of this. First of all, remember what I said earlier, that the excitement of a blockchain is primarily not being driven by the technology or the idea that, whoa, this is a great killer app. It's not like a word processor that said, wow, yes, that's it. People with blockchain, it's like, oh, this is cool. It's like, there's got to be something I can do with it because everyone's so excited about it. <laughs> And everyone's all excited about it because people have made billions and trillions of dollars off Bitcoin, and it's exciting. So, so people are not thinking clearly, yeah. right? Is this a disruptive technology? This is not a disruptive technology. It is a sort of foundational technology on which some people may create disruptive applications, cryptocurrency potentially being one of them. The question you just asked, which is, wait, we're a trust-based company, and now we're saying you can't trust us? is one that I'm not even sure Mark has thought of yet, right? Because I was at Trailhead DX and Mark talked about how he was at this session and he was sort of sold on blockchain by someone very passionate about it and said, we got to do blockchain. But I don't know if it has yet crossed his mind to say, wait a minute, we're promoting trust and now we're saying you can't trust. It is a really interesting question. Trust and verify. No, but if you, you haven't covered the concept of anonymous, okay? For Salesforce, everybody has to have an account, et cetera, et cetera. But you could have a model where you want anonymous and somebody can have it to log in and you keep a, a ledger of what's going on. You know, th there's... See, the whole Bitcoin thing is about anonymous. Who knows who owns the Bitcoin? Right. And, and here, here's a really interesting question because, of course, um, because Bitcoin has a trail, it is possible for governments and so on to figure out who owns Bitcoins in many cases, which they've used. Uh, and it's true that, you know, I did not mention that part of the 
driving force originally for, crypto for cryptocurrency was the perceived anonymity that you can then use it for criminal purposes, right? That was the, the money that drove the dark web, right? And maybe it still does for all I know. So, um, and in fact, I remember reading that people have switched away from Bitcoin on the dark web because governments have spent so much investment in figuring out how to track who and, who and so on. But, you know, enterprise applications, anonymity is a real interesting one. It's not necessarily something we really care about a lot for most enterprise applications. I mean, it's not a big thing. And here's another thing. Remember immutable, right? If you have any personally identifiable data, well, there's a GDPR and other uh, forces at work for privacy that say people have the right to remove their data. And you can't do that if it's in a Bitcoin, right? So, um, yeah. I don't know if there was a question in there. Yes, maybe there are applications. Vision, but, you know, Salesforce is not hitting the, uh, you know, the customer base for Salesforce is enterprise level. It's not the general public. Maybe it's one day they want to hit the general public or something. And this way they have uh, anonymous people come in and do something. And they maybe. Ledger. You know, one thing I did not go into is the fact that these public distributed ledgers are incredibly costly to run. Right? I mean, I, I can't remember what percentage of the world's energy is now being used to mine Bitcoin, yeah. but it's absurd, right? It's the equivalent of the Czech Republic right now. You know, so that's because of the way that Bitcoin rewards funneling wasted technological resources into these algorithms. And other people are still trying to figure out what is a different way other than proof of work to do this. Yes. I've been around this business a really long time too, and you'll probably remember the people who invented the phrase um, back. Um, I put my first Vibranet zones on those little PDPs. Uh, they came up with a phrase they called fun, fear, uncertainty, and doubt. And with all due respect, sir, this has been a presentation of fun. It has very little to do with what blockchain in my mind is about. Okay. It has very little to do with cryptocurrency and industrial study. And really, I don't think you do either Salesforce or blockchain justice when you say it's about people you hate or you can't trust. <laughs> We're working with people we trust, but you have to be able to verify. Blockchain has immutability. Your definition of blockchain is the same thing as TCP IP or any single record on a, uh, any disk that's ever been made. They are all blockchains by your definition. They don't have the required things. And what you showed there is kind of a nice learning demo, but you don't need to be so down on the technology. We need to understand that this distributed ledger is revolutionary technology. It's just not caught up in the cryptocurrency buzz, and it doesn't need to be the tool. And you know, you may, you, you may, you may be right. You know, you may be right. You know, um, and if I have erred in the side of being a, a naysayer, it's because so many people are on the side of true believers and are spreading, I would argue, fear, uncertainty, doubt is in the middle, not on, either end. on the other side. So, you know, maybe, maybe if, if the skeptics are speaking out and the true believers, then somewhere we will find the truth in the middle. Uh, I do believe that, that blockchain is an interesting technology. I think quicksort's an interesting technology, right? I think that I'm fascinated by algorithms. And I do believe that people are going to find applications for blockchain that make sense. My question and challenge in every case is, is your blockchain solution something that blockchain is the best way to do it? Right? And my sense is that a lot of people are choosing blockchain because that's how you can raise a boatload of money, because that's how you can get a lot of buzz, and that the question of is blockchain the best way to solve this problem doesn't necessarily come up. And to use my example earlier of the, um, of the foreign exchange, right? It takes two days to transfer money abroad and it can be done much faster in cryptocurrency. I would say, yeah, I would use cryptocurrency too for there. That sounds like a great application for cryptocurrency. But is it possible for those banks to speed up their process so it is faster and cheaper than using a cryptocurrency. If they wanted to, I think they could. I think they may choose not to, in which case cryptocurrency will have a great future there. Could, but we're back to cryptocurrency. And frankly, 
I don't even think that's of much of an interest to this group. I mean, anybody that really believes cryptocurrency is where their future is is probably not in the Salesforce ecosystem. And what I believe we're all really about blockchain now is, is how do we use it for real distributed applications where it is a huge, huge advance over our DVDMSs and all the other kinds of things like that for being able to do this thing. And the smart contracts, they are really important and able to do stuff. What we're doing with it is essentially each step of the chain, when it goes from the transportation takes it to a warehouse and checks it in, he gets paid. He gets paid then for that leg of his work. He doesn't have to submit a bill and have it approved and all the rest of it. The testing lab finishes their testing, they get paid now. Real world applications are abundant. I get the tulip scenario. I get the hype. And I totally, we chose not to do an ICO because of that. Frankly, mm -hmm. I think you lose all kinds of credibility the minute you do an ICO. Everybody I've seen done one has kind of like gotten lost in the mud. So, but reality is what we, I think everyone here really is all about is how blockchain as a technology can really be the distributed lever that is revolutionary. And, and maybe it is. I mean, maybe it will turn out to be that as compared to a niche thing. But then the question is, uh, a lot of the problems that blockchain solves, it's not clear that you can't do them using other mechanisms, it's not clear right? That you can't do them other ways, but you can do them much easier on blockchain. For instance, farm to table. Walmart <laughs> just implemented their trace and track system on the open ledger blockchain that tracks every piece of lettuce from the farm to the sandwich you just bought. Now you try to do that with the collection of RDBMSs and all the other systems and everything else that's out there right now or with any other way, and it's not practical, it's not gonna happen in real time, and it's not gonna deliver the value to the customer that he can actually see what they all is in his sandwich. Blockchain is the only technology that was viable to do that on, which is why it hasn't been done before. I have a friend in the seafood business. They have the same problem. They have finally built a blockchain so that there's a chance they can connect all of these other systems together in one place where they can actually see what's happening for track and trace. There are real applications. They're really good applications. They have nothing to do with, with and, cryptocurrency. And, and I think you're going to see more of them. And what I really look forward to is the point where we get rid of the hype and we get rid of the, the craziness that's around it, that is, that is brought about by the cryptocurrency, and People that it becomes. The tax day did a lot of that. And when, we, when, when everybody got hit with their capital gains, the fire went right out of that whole right. market, right? And so these days, it's not quite so exciting, and everybody got burned. So, you know, the, the whole, you know, it's all that. Right now, it's really dodgy if you want to do an ICO. And it's not guaranteed anymore. Last fall, absolutely. Right now, and it makes you look Bad. So I think we've really Good. already missed I, that point. I, I hope you're right. I hope you're right. And, and again, I, I do agree that there are going to be applications for this thing, right? And there already are, as you say. Um, but I think the key point, and what you did, which I really appreciate, is you took a look and I said, okay, is this the right tool for the job? And when everybody, whenever any developer is doing that and saying, here is a specific problem, here's a problem domain, and this is the right technology on which to build a solution, then I'm a fan. But I think a lot of people who are exploring this, who are doing this right now, they are saying, I got to do blockchain, and they're looking for something, and they're, they're misapplying it. That's right? absolutely true. There's one and that, example in our business where a company that didn't quite know what to do next, they were a, 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 a wannabe in a, in a finder market, decided to do an ICO last year. They raised about $30 million. They've created a blockchain. They rolled it from the ground up on their own, and all it does is store data. It has no smart contracts. It has really, it's useless, but it satisfied their ICO investors, and they're kind of in a corner now getting ready to die and try to find some way to sell this, this blockchain that only records data and doesn't do anything else. So absolutely you're right. There's been a lot of that. I do believe we've passed the peak of that with the block, with the Bitcoin fall and with the tax and capital gains issues. The majority of the heat has fallen out of that and we're getting back to a point of rationalness about it. I hope you're right. I, I think I think we're we're beginning to get there in the sense that people are, are at least a little more willing to be skeptical. But I really appreciate you, you bringing this up because it's good. Sorry, that, no a little bit yeah. over, so uh, Sorry. Last, last quick question here. Okay. Yeah, just to, to bring it back to something that's 
bring it back to out of the philosophical or out of the, the strategic and into something very tactical. You talked about uh, a, a distributed database, and, and when I initially was thinking about that, I thought, well, you know, lots of clients logging on to a cloud-based database, but really you're talking about local copies, right, that you could, that would be proved in, uh, different from something that had been tampered. Yeah, I, I, think, I think one of the essences of blockchain is that you don't have one absolute source of truth, but it is distributed and everybody sort of has their own, their own record. The big difference between a public and a private blockchain in this sense, at least as I present it, is that this is a read-only distributed database where everybody has their own copy of the blockchain that they can validate and so on. So you don't have the complexity that comes apart about from having to control who gets to write to the blockchain and having to do with proof of work in the case of some cases and, and whatever solutions they come up with that say, okay, who can write, who is allowed to write to the blockchain, who's allowed to commit transactions, and how do you figure out which transactions are valid? We get to avoid all of that in this solution because Salesforce and your org controls which records are valid, who gets to write to the blockchain. But you have to have the distributed nature or you'd Right. You know, you're so, so in addition to what you showed us uh, that you built in Apex, you would also have to build a distribution network for that, a, a periodic here's today's copy. Well, I cheated here and I said, I'm just going to use Salesforce platform events and publish records as they're created. And anybody who wants to can subscribe to the platform event because you can have multiple subscribers. Yeah. Well, thanks. Lots of technologies you could use to do that. Anyway, right. uh, but much, as you Dan. can see, a lot of debate and discussion and disagreement in this area. So thank you and thank you all.